After the hard-earned triumph of Starship's Flight 10, a mission that followed several setbacks but finally showcased the rocket's full potential, SpaceX is already pushing ahead to the next big step, Flight 11. For this mission, the company has paired Super Heavy Booster 15, which has now completed a static fire test, with Ship 38, the upper stage that is nearly ready to begin its own test campaign. Let's get into the details. The centerpiece of Flight 11 is Booster 15, a stage with a unique history. This is the same Super Heavy that was caught by the launch tower arms during Flight 8 in March. With its selection for another mission, it becomes only the second booster to fly twice, after Booster 14, which powered Flight 7 and 9. Reusing these massive stages isn't just about saving hardware. It's a test of durability. Can a 70-meter first stage with 33 Raptor engines survive the extreme stresses of launch, the heating, vibration, and aerodynamic loads of re-entry, and the dynamics of recovery well enough to fly again? Proving this is key to SpaceX's vision of full and rapid reusability. Before being cleared for another flight, Booster 15 underwent a full round of inspections. Engineers checked the engines, propellant feed lines, hydraulic and electromechanical systems, and the web of avionics tying everything together. After this extensive round of system-level inspections, fixes, and upgrades, Booster 15 was officially cleared for another flight. Late Friday night, the vehicle exited the mega bay and rolled down to the launch complex. At the launch site, it was moved to the pad, where the tower arms moved into position, latched on, and lifted it onto the orbital launch mount. Once secured, ground crews began preparing it for the static fire test. On Sunday morning, Booster 15 completed a static fire test with all 33 Raptor engines ignited for roughly 10 seconds. The test served as a critical validation of the propulsion system, covering ignition sequencing, thrust ramp up, propellant feed dynamics, engine stability, and the vehicle's structural response under sustained multi-engine loads. As of this video, SpaceX has not revealed how many engines came from Flight 8 versus new installations. All 33, however, were confirmed to have performed nominally. This result is an encouraging indication that Raptors remain flight-worthy even after experiencing the stresses of ascent. The extreme heating and dynamic pressure of atmospheric re-entry and the thermal loads endured by their nozzles during Flight 8. With its static fire complete, Booster 15 is now technically ready for Flight 11. The stage will soon return to the production site for post-test inspections and final pre-launch work, including installation of the hot stage adapter, integration of the flight termination system, and final configuration tasks such as minor system adjustments and hardware outfitting needed for flight certification. Meanwhile, Ship 38, Booster 15's flight partner, is in Mega Bay 2, nearing readiness for static fire the last test before flight clearance. Before Ship 38 can undergo static fire, the orbital launch mount must be reconfigured for ship testing, as the Massey site remains offline for repairs and upgrades following the Ship 36 anomaly. Just as they did for Ship 37 testing, ground crews will first remove the booster hold-down clamps and install the dedicated Starship test stand inside the mount. After that, they will modify the booster quick disconnect system by cutting open its protective hood and rerouting the main propellant feed lines to create a temporary connection at the top of the BQD, allowing propellants to be transferred directly into the ship for static firing. These reconfiguration tasks are expected to take two to three weeks. By the time the ground hardware is ready, Ship 38 should also be fully prepared for static fire. If all goes to plan, the static fire could occur later this month, and with SpaceX's current turnaround pace, Flight 11 could follow within two weeks, suggesting a possible mid-October launch window. Flight 11 will also be the last Block 2 Starship mission before the transition to Block 3 vehicles. Block 3 reflects design improvements informed by data from all previous flights, including structural loads, aerodynamic performance, propulsion system behavior, and ground operations metrics. These lessons have been systematically applied to enhance structural strength, improve system reliability, and enhance readiness for operational missions. The Block 3 debut will feature Ship 39 and Booster 18. Ship 39's nose cone has already been stacked onto its payload section inside the Star Factory, with full integration in Mega Bay 2 expected soon. Booster 18 is advancing as well, introducing a reinforced methane transfer tube and new grid fins with improved aerodynamics for more precise descent control. Beyond Block 3, SpaceX is already working on Block 4, a taller, more powerful variant optimized for rapid reusability at scale.
I've already broken down the structural, propulsion, and systems level upgrades planned for both Block 3 and Block 4 in earlier deep dive videos, which you can find linked in the description. Beyond being the final Block 2 launch, Flight 11 will also be the last mission to use Pad 1's orbital launch mount. The mount cannot support Block 3 vehicles, as its infrastructure is incompatible with the updated Starship design, particularly the redesigned aft section of Super Heavy. After Flight 11, SpaceX plans to decommission the OLM and replace it with a Pad 2-style launch system, as outlined in the latest Starbase expansion plan. Until the new pad is operational, all subsequent launches, starting with Flight 12, will take place from Pad 2, which is currently in the final stages of construction. Work on the orbital launch mount is nearing completion, with all major hardware installed and support infrastructure in the final stages of assembly. Electrical and plumbing lines from the gantry, supplying power, instrumentation, and propellant feed connections to the Super Heavy booster are being finalized and integrated with the mount. On the launch tower arms, teams have installed the final major components, the twin vehicle stabilizer arms on both chopsticks, which provide lateral restraint and precise alignment during stacking and handling, maintaining vehicle stability under wind loads and operational forces. The flame diverter system is also nearing completion. The final sidewall of the flame trench was installed recently, marking the trench's structural works as nearly finished. Development of the water deluge system continues in parallel. Following the initial debut of the gas generator turbine last month, several additional tests have been conducted in recent days. The system uses a methane oxygen turbine to rapidly convert cryogenic nitrogen into high-pressure gas, which drives water from the large horizontal tanks across the pad at high flow rates. Unlike Pad 1's static cylinder setup, this turbine design delivers greater force, faster response, and more precise control, ensuring efficient and evenly distributed water coverage during operations. The latest tests of this system varied both pressure levels and run durations to evaluate performance under different operational loads, simulating the range of water flow rates required for static fire tests and actual launches. The propellant distribution network is approaching completion. All pumps, tanks, heat exchangers, and auxiliary support equipment have been installed throughout the site. The supply lines linking the tank farm to the launch pad are fully routed and secured. Multiple pressure tests were performed last month using gaseous nitrogen to verify integrity, detect leaks, and confirm proper flow, with additional tests planned before introducing actual cryogenic propellants. The final major hardware task is installing the ship quick disconnect mechanism, which is being pre-assembled at the Sanchez site. All internal components that must be pre-installed before rollout to the launch site appear to be in place. On the launch tower, crews have begun preparing the area around the ship's SQD attachment point for scaffolding installation. At the current operational pace, Pad 2 could be ready to support Starship launches by the end of this year. Meanwhile, recovery and reconstruction efforts at the Massey test site are progressing at full speed. One of the most visible changes is the replacement of the old methane tank farm, which sustained damage during the Ship 36 explosion, with a more robust setup featuring new storage tanks, upgraded pumps, and modern heat exchangers. These upgrades will not only restore the farm's functionality, but also increase its resilience and efficiency for handling supercooled propellants. Work has also advanced on the underground propellant transfer system. Crews have completed trench digging for the new delivery lines that will feed liquid methane to the static fire stand. Focus has now shifted to building reinforced trench walls, which will shield the buried pipelines. Adjacent to the trench, construction is underway on a heavily reinforced bunker. The structure likely houses propellant sensors, flow control valves, electrical systems, and monitoring equipment. By moving the pipes underground and support equipment into a bunker, SpaceX is effectively protecting critical infrastructure from potential future accidents or debris in the event of another vehicle explosion. Inside the flame trench, crews are continuing repairs on the water-cooled steel flame diverter pipes damaged during the last test. Meanwhile, the static fire stand is undergoing a partial rebuild. Portions of the stand that were damaged have been stripped down and will soon be replaced with new steel structures. The damaged ship hold-down clamps were removed weeks ago and are now set to be replaced by redesigned units, offering improved strength and reliability for testing next-gen Block 3 ships. The site is also preparing for Block 3 booster testing. 
the brand new cryogenic test stand under construction, which is designed specifically for next generation super heavy prototypes, was recently outfitted with a dual quick disconnect system. This setup mirrors the design at Pad 2, where one QD feeds chilled liquid methane and the other supplies subcooled liquid oxygen. By introducing this system at Massey, SpaceX ensures that future Block 3 boosters can undergo realistic fueling and cryogenic load tests before ever reaching the launch pad. If progress continues at this pace, Massey will soon re-emerge as a stronger, more capable facility, ready to handle the demands of the next generation of Starship and Super Heavy vehicles ahead of Flight 12. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Comet 3i Atlas is currently at the center of intense global scientific attention as the third confirmed interstellar visitor to our solar system. Since its discovery, it has offered scientists a rare glimpse into the composition and dynamics of distant planetary systems. Here's what observations so far have revealed. Interstellar objects are celestial bodies that originate from outside our solar system, often ejected by gravitational interactions with planets or stars. They drift through interstellar space for millions to billions of years and may eventually pass through another star system, such as ours. Comet 3i Atlas was first spotted on July 1st by the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS, a survey program run by the University of Hawaii designed to spot near-Earth objects. Since its discovery, astronomers have mobilized ground-based telescopes and space observatories across multiple wavelengths to study it. Early orbital backtracing suggests it originated in the Milky Way's thick disk, a population of older stars lying above and below the thin galactic plane, and was slingshotted out of its home system, making it potentially 7 to 11 billion years old, far older than our 4.6 billion year old solar system. Like a typical comet, 3i Atlas is active. Sunlight warms its surface, driving the release of gas and dust that form a coma tens of thousands of kilometers wide and a faint tail. The nucleus remains hidden, but estimates place its size between 320 meters and 5.6 kilometers, with a rotation period of 16 to 17 hours. Spectroscopic analysis reveals a volatile-rich composition. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, carbon monoxide, and carbonyl sulfide dominate the coma. Trace detections include cyanide and even nickel vapor. As the comet approaches the sun, sublimating water ice is expected to intensify, enlarging the coma and brightening the tail. The comet's trajectory is hyperbolic, confirming it isn't bound to the sun and will depart the solar system after this flyby. Traveling at 61 kilometers per second, it will pass just 28 million kilometers from Mars on October 3rd, about a fifth of the Earth-Sun distance, close enough for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Perseverance rover to capture unique data. Its closest Earth approach will be later, at 270 million kilometers, before it continues back into interstellar space. 3i Atlas is only the third known interstellar visitor. The first, Oumuamua, discovered in 2017, had no coma or tail and appeared as an elongated, tumbling body, sparking speculation ranging from natural origin to alien probe. The second, Comet 2i Borisov, found in 2019, was the first confirmed interstellar comet, displaying clear cometary activity. Interstellar visitors like these offer rare glimpses into the building blocks and chemistry of other planetary systems. As 3i Atlas moves through our solar system, scientists continue to monitor its composition, outgassing behavior, and any signs of fragmentation or sudden activity. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.